You're listening to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast, a place for sex addicts to share their experiences of recovery, to help break the stigma, myths, and misconceptions of sex addiction. This podcast may contain topics of sexuality, sexual trauma, dysfunction, or other things that may be triggering. So listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast. My name is Jason, I'm a sex addict, and I will be your podcast host for today. What is going on, everyone? Welcome to episode 127 of the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast. Well, after taking a few weeks off, I am now feeling a little bit better. As you can tell, my voice is recovering, and I'm finally able to start recording again. So I haven't done any interviews for quite some time, but I do have a couple of recordings that I wish to share as episodes. So this week, I thought I would share the Joe and Charlie Big Book Comes Alive, where they are talking about step three. And for anyone new to the podcast, I've been playing some old tapes from AA speakers Joe and Charlie talking about the big book. And this all started from wanting to get episodes out about step four, and their coverage is amazing. So episodes 63, 68, 71, and 75 is where we started with Joe and Charlie, and again, those were step four. And wanting to get back into Joe and Charlie, I started off with steps one and two and the doctor's opinion on episode 109. And we continued with their work on step two with the chapter There is a Solution and the Spiritual Experience on episode 115. And concluding step two with chapter four from the big book, We Agnostics. And so for this episode, they will be talking about chapter five, how it works, and step three. What's interesting in this recording is they use the original manuscript for the beginning of how it works. This was where Bill W., with the suggestion of the uh, Greater Fellowship, had to rewrite a lot of the language that he wrote. Joe and Charlie cover the original wording. And so for the reading for this episode, I just wanted to read a quick part from the original manuscript. And I will be providing a link for the original manuscript to the AA Big Book in the show notes for this episode. Right where they end their discussion of the manuscript and go back into the Big Book proper, there was one little paragraph here that I wanted to read. And this is after the section, our description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostic, and our personal adventures before and after. So there's this paragraph. If you are convinced, you are now at step three, which is that you make a decision to turn your will and your life to God as you understand him. Just what do we mean by that and just what do we do? The first requirement is that you see that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. And as Joe and Charlie go over this, they do talk about how there's the changing of you to we. So yeah, it's a real interesting discussion. And they also talk about the third step prayer in the big book. And I believe I've talked about it on several episodes of the podcast. But here at the beginning, I did also want to read the alternate version of the third step prayer. And on the Bay Area website, we do have multiple versions of the third step prayer. The one from Alcoholics Anonymous, page 63 is there. And there's also an alternate version And the one that I recite is kind of a hybrid of the two. So here is the alternate version. God, I offer myself to you to build with me and do with me as you will. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do your will. Walk me through my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of your power, your love, and your way of life. May I do your will always. So the one that I use is what Joe recites in this recording. Charlie leads the group at the end of the recording through the third step prayer that is on page 63 with all the the thou and thy. So anyway, I wanted to read that here at the beginning of the episode. And now, without further ado, Joe and Charlie wrapping up the end of chapter four, We Agnostics, and starting the beginning of How It Works and the 12 Steps. And segueing from that into step three. Here it is. I hope you enjoy it. I 
can almost see Bill now as he finishes up this chapter and he sits back and reviews what he's done up to this point again. Probably says to himself, in the doctor's opinion, in my story, Bill's story, I was able to show them the problem. In chapter 2, I was able to show them the solution. In chapter 3, I was able to show them what's going to happen to them if they don't find that solution. And in chapter 4, I was able to give them some new ideas so that they would be able to make a decision about that solution. Probably says to himself, I think I've given them all the preliminary information they now need. It's now time to get down to the main object of the book, to tell them how to find that power. And he sits down and he begins to write on how it works. And Bill had a lot of difficulty with how it works for two or three reasons. Number one, we had people coming into AA, many Protestants. We had Catholics coming into AA. We had some Jewish people coming into AA. We begin to see a sprinkling of Muslims coming into AA. And he's getting ready to write a set of directions on how to find God. And how in the world are you going to do that without offending a bunch of people? Also, they had made six little steps from the Oxford group. And Bill could see loopholes in those steps that the alcoholic mind was slipping through. And he felt they need to be expanded and strengthened. He didn't know how far. He just knew they need to be expanded and strengthened. And he said he tried and he tried and he tried and he tried. And he just could not get started on chapter 5. He said one night while in bed, pillow behind his back, pad and pencil in hand, leaning against the headboard, trying to start chapter 5. And he said, I finally just gave up. He said, I put the pad and pencil down, closed my eyes, and prayed and meditated. I have no idea what he said, but I'm sure he asked God for help. And he said he prayed and meditated for 15 or 20 minutes. And then he said when he picked up the pad and the pencil, it felt as if the pencil had a mind of its own as it raced across the pages. In about a half hour, he had written how it works. This thing that we read at all of our AA meetings today, which includes the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> when he got finished with it, he was highly enthused about it. There was another member of the Oxford group alcoholic that came by to see Bill. They knew that usually at night he stayed up late working on this stuff. And this other member was a guy named Howard. And Howard had a new pigeon with him. And they come to see Bill and Bill got up and he could hardly wait to show him the do 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Hmm. And Howard said, what in the hell is this? <laughs> he said, hell, Bill, Moses only had ten. <laughs> and here you've got twelve. You know how you'd feel if you left your grown group last week and they had twelve steps and you go back next week and they got twenty-four. <laughs> yeah. And the fight was on. And they fought and they fought. Bill had to take this, remember... The original 40 people said, we want to see the chapters as you write them. And we'll add to, delete from, and change around. Bill made copies of this, sent it to these other members, and that's when the crap hit the fan. Now, Joe is going to read to you the original, how it works, as Bill wrote it that night. Not the way it is in the book today. And if you'll follow through with him, I think you'll be able to see the differences I also think you'll be able to see what the other members objected to also. And I'm sure Joe, by changing the tone of his voice or pausing, will be able to point out these differences. Joe, would you read 
how it works, please. You'll also get to see what Bill really meant by these things, too. How it works. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our directions. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. They're not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a way of life which demands rigorous honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those two who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like and what happened and what we're like now. now if you decide you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to follow directions. <laughs> At some of these, you may balk. You may think you can find an easier, softer way. We doubt if you can. <laughs> With all the earnestness of our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go, absolutely. Remember that you are dealing with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for you. But there is one who has all power. That one is God. You must find him now. <laughs> Half measures will avail you nothing. You stand at the turning point. Throw yourself under his protection and care with complete abandon. Now we think you can take it. Here are the steps we took which are suggested as your program of recovery. One, admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over the care and direction of God as we understood him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely willing that God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly, on our knees, asking to remove our shortcomings, holding nothing back. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make complete amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our contact with God, praying only for the knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. Twelve, having had a spiritual experience as a result of this course of action, we tried to carry this message to others, especially alcoholics, and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. Now you may exclaim, what an order. I can't go through with it. But do not be discouraged. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We're not saints. The point is that we're willing to grow along spiritual lines, the principle we have set down are guides to progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Our description of the alcoholic. Now we found that in the doctor's opinion, Bill's story, some of it in chapters 2 and 3. The chapter to the agnostic. Chapter 4. And our personal adventures before and after. Bill's story and those in the back of the book. Have been designed to sell you three pertinent ideas. Well, <laughs> Bill was a salesman, you know. A, that you are alcoholic and cannot manage your own life. Step one. B, that probably no human power can relieve your alcoholism. Part of step two. C, that God can and will. The rest of step two. Now, if you're not convinced on these vital issues, you ought to reread the book to this point or else just throw it away. <laughs> I don't think he was kidding around, was he? You know, it's evident that Bill did not intend for this to be a set of suggestions. 
He intended for it to be a set of directions. He said so three or four different times. A set of directions to the individual alcoholic on how to recover from alcoholism. Because he kept saying, you got to do this, and you got to do that, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. And that's when the crap hit the fan. Well, the other member said, Bill, you don't have any business giving anybody directions. Nobody can give directions in this little fellowship. And they said, you don't have any business telling any individuals what they have to do. And they said, Bill, this sounds too much like the Oxford Group Absolutes. You're talking about on your knees, holding nothing back, complete amends. Sounds too much like absolute honesty, and so on and so on and so forth. They said, you need to change this. And Bill said, no, I don't either. I'm not going to change this. And they said, well, yeah, you are. And he said, no, I'm not. And they said, Bill, don't you remember? This is not your book, it's ours. And we have the right to insist on changing it any way we want to. And Bill said, I don't care, I'm not going to change it. And they said, yeah, you are. And he said, what you guys don't understand, these aren't even my words. He said, these are God's words. They came after prayer and meditation. And they said, we don't give a damn whose words they are. We're going to change it. And the fight was on. And they almost destroyed not only the book project, they almost destroyed the little fellowship over the writing of how it works. And Bill very, very reluctantly finally realized if they're going to get on with the rest of the book, he's going to have to compromise. So he said to them, he said, I'm willing to compromise, but you guys are going to have to compromise with me. And they said, well, what do you want? And he said, if I'm to finish the rest of the book, you're going to have to give me the authority to do so. He said, I'm tired. I'm not going to fight with you anymore. And they didn't want to give him that authority. He said, if you don't want to do that, then you finish the book. And they didn't want to give him that authority. But they didn't want to finish the book either. And they very reluctantly agreed to make those changes. A non-alcoholic psychiatrist who was around in those days said, why don't you change it from directions to suggestions? He still would get your meaning across. And you probably wouldn't alienate so many people. And he said, well, you keep saying you, you, you. He said, don't do that. He said, say we, we, we. Tell them this is what we had to do rather than what you have to do. And where you keep saying must, must, change that to ought, ought. And probably more people would use your book. Now, we don't know. If they hadn't made those changes instead of two million worldwide today, we might have ten million. But also, if they hadn't made those changes instead of two million worldwide today, we might only have ten thousand. Who knows? We just know that this is the history behind this particular part of the book. But Bill was cunning and baffling and powerful too. <laughs> because when he forced this compromise on them, and they gave him the authority to finish the rest of the book, what they didn't know but what he knew is two pages later he's going to put directions right back in the book. <laughs> and he's going to put you and must right back in the book. He's had it all the way up to this time, jerked it out of how it works, and then turned right around and put it right back in and destroyed some of the continuity of the book. But now that we know what happened, we can see what actually transpired and took place there. The other thing that is so important is when he said our description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostic, and our personal adventures before and after have been designed to sell you three pertinent ideas. And the three pertinent ideas are contained in steps one and two. And then he said, if you're not convinced on these vital issues, you ought to reread the book to this point or else throw it away because you can't go any further unless you got one and two behind you. People come to us today and they say, well, how do you work steps one and two? And we say you don't. 
They're not working steps. They're not action steps. They're conclusions of the mind that we draw based on information presented to us in the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters. I've always been powerless over alcohol. My life has always been unmanageable because of that. I just did not know that, nor did I know why. And not until I read the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters. There's always been a power greater than I am could restore me to sanity. I just didn't think that power would do so. Nor did I understand the insanity I had to be restored from until I read the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters. Now, if I can say to myself today, you betcha, I'm powerless over alcohol. My life has become unmanageable. I'm through with step one. If I can say to myself today, you betcha, I believe there's a power greater than I am can restore me to sanity. I'm through with step two. And I don't think it's by accident. The very next statement in the book says, being convinced on those vital issues, being convinced we are now at step three. You see, that's why you can't start with chapter 5. Because chapter 5 starts with step 3. And it's hard to start with 3 unless you got 1 and 2 behind you from the doctor's opinion and the first four chapters, Joe. So it said being convinced we were at step 3. We're not ready to take step 3 yet. We're just at step 3. Let's talk about 3 for just a little bit and then we'll take a break. Okay. Which is that we decided to turn our will and our life over to God's we understood Him. Just what do we mean by that? Just what do we do? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? We're going to make a decision to turn our will. What is our will? Our will is our thinking. Our life is our actions. We're going to make a decision to turn our thinking and our life, our actions, over the care and direction of God as we understood Him. Major, major decisions to be made here. I hear many people today say, I've been in AA five years. My life's still all screwed up. Don't understand why. Because I turned it over to God four years ago when it took step three. No, we don't turn anything over to God in step three. We make a decision to turn something over. And the word decision itself implies there's going to have to be some further action. A good example in my own life. My wife Barbara and I, some years ago, we decided to go to Los Angeles, California to visit some relatives. But we didn't do anything to carry out that decision. And sure enough, we didn't get to California either. (laughs) The second year in a row, we made the same decision. Still didn't do anything to carry it out, and we didn't get to California either. Third year in a row, we made the same decision, only this time it was a little different. I took the car down and had it serviced. Barbara packed some clothes and a little food, and we got in our car and we drove from our home to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Then we drove to Oklahoma City. Then we drove to Amarillo, Texas. Then we drove to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Then we drove to Flagstaff, Arizona. Then we drove to Barstow, California. Then we drove to Los Angeles. And we ended up visiting with our relatives in their living room. Not because we made a decision to do so, but because we took the action necessary to carry out that decision. All we're doing in step three is making a decision to do something. What are we deciding to do? We're making a decision to turn our will over to the care, and the step originally said, and direction of God as we understood Him. Now what is our will? Our will is nothing more than our thinking apparatus. Our will is nothing more than this thing up here in our head that tells us what to do and what not to do. You know, a good example of tying will and thinking together is let's say some of us are beginning to approach the end of our lives. We've gathered up a few material things and we become concerned with what's going to happen to them when we pass on. If we get concerned enough, we'll go sit down with an attorney and we'll tell that attorney what we want done with these things. 
I want this to go to my wife, I want this to go to my daughter, I want this to go to my son, and etc. And that attorney will take my thinking from my mind that day, write it down in legal terms on a sheet of paper, and I'll sign it and maybe the attorney will sign it as a witness and we put it in a safe. Now a year or two later, sure enough, I kicked the bucket. And if my family's like the rest of them, they're not going to wait very long. <laughs> they're going to call the undertaker and say, come and get him and get him ready so we can get him out there and get him in the ground. Hell, used to, they waited four or five days. Today, they do it in just a day or two. They don't waste much time. They take me out to the cemetery and I'm suspended in a box over a hole in the ground. Few people standing around it, and I hope they're AA people. And hopefully somebody will utter a little prayer. And then they'll start dropping me in the hole. Now, if my family's like the rest of them, they don't even wait till I get to the bottom of the hole. <laughs> they jump in the car and they go right back to that attorney's office. And that attorney gets out that piece of paper and reads to them my thinking when I was in his, that office two or three years prior to that time. We know they call that piece of paper a will, and it's not by accident. Will, thinking, mind are all synonymous. I'm making a decision to turn my thinking apparatus over to the care of God as I understand Him. And by the way, as far as we know, we're the only species on earth that's ever faced with this decision. Because as far as we know, we're the only species on earth that has this thing called self-will. Everything else on earth they operate on God's will in God's time. But for some reason, He gave us the right to operate on self-will or God's will. So we're making a decision to turn our will over to the care of God as we understand it. What else are we deciding to turn over? We're making a decision to turn our life over to the care of God as we understand it. What is my life? My life is nothing more than my actions. What I am right now, as of this moment, sitting behind this table, is the sum accumulative total of all the actions I've taken throughout my entire lifetime is what's made me what I am today. Now we know all action is born in thought. Say that again, please. All action is born in thought. Sometimes we react to a situation so fast we think we'd do it automatically, but we don't. I can't even pick up this glass of water unless my mind tells my body to do so. So if all action is born in thought, then it stands to reason my life is going to be determined by how I think. If my thinking is okay, my actions are okay, and my life becomes okay. If my thinking is lousy, my actions are lousy, and my life is going to be lousy too. And I went to my sponsor, and I said, I don't believe I can take step three. And he said, why? And I said, because if I turn my will and my life over the care of God as I understand Him, I have no idea what He would have me be. He may want me to be a missionary, and He may want to send me to China, and I sure as hell don't want to go to China. <laughs> and he just laughed. <laughs> He said, well, let's look at it this way. At least it wouldn't be in the hands of an idiot, would it? <laughs> he said, let's look back through your lifetime, Charlie. He said, you've always been a selfish, self-centered, self-willed human being. You've always done what you wanted to do and to hell with the rest of them. Is that right? And I said, you know it is. He said, the end result is you've almost destroyed your life. And he said, just as important, you've almost destroyed the lives of those around you that care for you. He said, just think, if God could direct your thinking, it might become better. And he said, if your thinking becomes better, then your actions will probably become better. And he said, if your actions become better, then your life's going to become better. And he said, just as important, the lives of those around you that care for you might become better also. He stepped back about three feet, stuck his bony old finger right in the middle of my chest, and he said, now you 
have to make the decision. He said, I wish I could make it for you, but I can't. This is one you'll have to do yourself. And he got it through to me in such a way that I was willing to make the decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand Him simply because of the fact that I had almost destroyed it myself and God couldn't do a worse job with it than I did. And based on that, I made the decision. Joe? My book says that the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will could hardly be a success. Remember, we talked about precisely, specifically, exactly with clear-cut directions. We're beginning to get those directions now. And it says the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. On that basis, we're almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. Most people try to live by self-propulsion. Each person is like an actor who wants to run the whole show, is forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players in his own way. If his arrangements would only stay put, if only people would do as he wished, the show would be great. Everybody, including himself, would be pleased. Life would be wonderful. Now, isn't that true? If everybody would mind me and do what I tell them to do, they would be happier and I would be happier. Now, I've been married to Phyllis for, off and on for 37 years. <laughs> Jim, I don't believe she's going to mind. <laughs> 37 years now, she doesn't mind. I don't think she's going to. The reason is, is see, I have a will for Phyllis, and Phyllis has a will for herself. Everybody's got one. That's the problem with it. And my will for Phyllis is not always her will for Phyllis. And I try to force my will on Phyllis, we have problems. Big problems. Sometimes they throw your stuff out in the yard. <laughs> which used to happen. Because I'm trying to force my life and my, my will on Phyllis. I need to stop doing that. The first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a, a success. I have to give that up. Let's go over to page 62. First paragraph. Selfishness, self-centeredness. That, we think, is the root of our troubles. Driven by a hundred forms of fear. Self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. We step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation. But we invariably find that at some time in the past, we have made decisions based on self which later placed us in a position to be hurt. So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves, and the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of this selfishness. We must, or it kills us. God makes that possible. There often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. Many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them even though we would have liked to. Neither could we reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own power. We had to have God's help. This is the how and the why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. You know, if this is a God-directed world, and everything I read leads me to believe that's so, then those of us who have been self-directed and those of us who have been trying to direct everything and everybody around us, well, we've been trying to do God's work for Him. And we're not God. We've just been playing at being God. Next, we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director, not our suggester. <laughs> he is the principal, we are his agents. He is the father and we are his children. Most good ideas are simple. And this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we passed to freedom. Now we're referring to that wonderfully effective spiritual structure again. Step one, willingness was the foundation. Step two, believing was the cornerstone. Now he tells us we're building an arch. They're going to pass through to freedom, 
And the keystone of that arch, which is the stone up in top of the arch that holds it in place, the keystone is one simple little idea. We're going to let God be the director. Most good ideas are simple. And it couldn't be any more simpler than this. To decide that instead of being self-directed, I'm going to start trying to be God-directed. And by the way, there's no other choices. I either operate on self-will or God's will, one of the two. I'm trying to get off of self-will, which almost destroyed me, and start trying to get on God's will, hoping that it will make it better in the future. I almost missed that little simple idea. Because when I first started praying, I said, God, give me this, and God, give me that, and get my wife back for me, help me make more money, get me a new car. I used God like he would an errand boy to go out and take care of stuff for me. And after I'd been sober for a while, I read in that other other big book, it said he, re- he worked for six days, and then he rested. To my knowledge, he'd never go back to work anymore. <laughs> it looks to me like there's going to be any work being done around here. It's going to be me. He's the father. We're the children. He's the principal. We're the agent. Most good ideas are simple. And this concept, was the keystone of the new and triumphant arts to which we passed to freedom. I almost missed that. Our book says that when we sincerely took such a position, page 63, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer. Being all-powerful, he provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. I'm supposed to perform his work well. I thought he was supposed to perform my work well, but he didn't. Now, now here's the results of this thing. We don't have to wait till step 12 to get something out of it. Look at the results of this decision. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. More and more, we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. See, takers are losers, you see. Not only in AA, but everywhere. Takers are losers. Today, I'm trying to see what I can contribute to life instead of take. As we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of his presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter we were reborn. And boy, I used to hate that idea about being reborn. I sure did. They used to come over my house and talk to me about being reborn, knocking on the door, want to come in and visit and talk to me about being reborn. (laughs) And you know what I said to him? I said, boys, this is Monday night football. And I'm here drinking and having a good time, and you're coming over. Get your, and going back home. That was a nice version of it. And going back home. See, they were trying to help me. But I didn't know that. But I could buy these ideas that we've been talking about. And now I was ready to do this third step. I was definitely ready. Our book said we were now at step three. And I couldn't wait to get down to that little church the next Sunday. I got there about 11 o'clock, and they do this every Sunday about 11 o'clock, not only there, but in many, many places. They basically are asking people to come and do the third step prayer. Okay? And I got there about two or three minutes before 11. I didn't want to get there too early. I might hear something that helped me. <laughs> you know? So I got there about two or three minutes before 11. And they asked people to come down and do the third step, basically. And this is what I did. Many of us said to our makers, we understood him. God, I offer myself to you to build with me and do with me as you will. Relieve me of the bonds of self that I may better do your will. Take away my difficulty that victory over them may bear witness to those that I would help of your power, your love, and your way of life. May I do your will always. We thought well before taking this, making this step making sure that we were ready, that we could at last abandon ourselves utterly to him. Now, I don't know what happened that morning. I'm not smart enough to know. But I know from that morning until this day, my life hasn't been the same. It had been like I've been on the dark side of the street for all those years. And after this third step, I'm on the sunny side of the street. I went over to my mom's house that afternoon, and she wanted to know what happened. You know, they always want to know what happened, don't they? Bill asked 
Abby said, what's this all about? I queried. What's this? In other words, what's happened to you, Abby? And my mother said to me, what happened to you? Benny Joe, that's my name. That's what she called me. Mm-hmm. And I told her about this experience, and she smiled. That's all she ever wanted from her children was to live that way. That's all she ever wanted. Later on, I went over to see Phyllis, and if Phyllis was telling this story, she would say that I was her Abby. There was something about my eyes. I was inexplicably different, she said. What happened? See, I don't know. There's a story in that other big, big book. They asked that guy, I said, what happened to you? He said, I don't know. He said, I was blind and now I can see. I don't know. I was drunk and now I'm sober. That's all I really do know, you see. We thought well before taking this step, making sure we were ready, that we could at last abandon ourselves utterly to Him. And I think utterly means completely, wholeheartedly, the whole ball of wax. Don't make the mistake I did. First time I took step three, I got on my knees, which I very seldom did. And I said, God, I offer myself to thee the bill with me and do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage yourself, so on, so on, and so forth. And I said, now this applies to my alcohol. <laughs> Don't fool with my sex life. <laughs> Stay out of my money. I can take care of that too. God probably said, water and order. I can't go through with it. <laughs> Today I realize that God doesn't want my alcohol. He probably doesn't even drink. (laughs) He wants all of me completely. And just think, if He could direct all my thinking, it might become better in the sex area. If He can direct all my thinking, it might become better in the economic area. If He could direct my thinking in all areas of my life, then my life should become better in all areas not just dealing with alcohol, but everything else. We found it very desirable to take this spiritual step with an understanding person, such as our wife, best friend, or spiritual advisor. You know, we are, as human beings, we are tridimensional creatures. We are meant to live with God. We're meant to live with ourselves. We're meant to live with our fellow human beings. And if we take this step with another human being. For the first time now, we're starting to fix ourselves, fit ourselves back together as God intends for us to be in the first place. That's why it says to God and another human being here in this thing. Now, we're going to ask you to do a favor just before we take the break. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. But we're going to ask you to anyhow. We're going to ask you to reach out and hold hands with those on each side of you. And I'm going to read this step. And I'm going to ask you to repeat it after me. God, I offer myself to Thee. God, I offer myself to Thee. To build with me and do with me as Thou wilt. To build with me and do with me as Thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self. Relieve me of the bondage of self. That I may better do thy will. That I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties. Take away my difficulties. That victory over them may bear witness. That victory over them may bear witness. To those I would help of thy power. To those that I would help of thy power. Thy love. Thy love. And thy way of life. And thy way of life. May I do thy will always. May I do thy will always. Amen. Amen. You'll never have to worry about step three. You're just taking it right now. <laughs> all, all we have to do now is do it every day, one day at a time. Let's take about a little short 10, 15-minute break, then we're going to jump right into step four. We need to be back now in about 10 or 15 minutes. I always love listening to the Joe and Charlie Big Book Comes Alive tapes. And so this does bring us up to step four, which again, we've covered in four separate episodes of the podcast. 
And so the next Joe and Charlie episode that I do will be covering step five and getting to chapter six into action. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, I have taken a few weeks off. I am still very congested. I'm having a hard time hearing in my right ear. Uh, So I haven't been really eager to get on the microphone and record much. The next episode of the podcast will be coming from a workshop that I did at the Bay Area Retreat. And beyond that, we've got another SAA and COSA speaker meeting that is coming up in the beginning of May. And hopefully I will have the links for those as well. And I did receive a few emails with some topic suggestions for future podcast episodes. And one of them will be on sponsorship. And I haven't started scheduling new recordings yet, but that will be coming in the future. For the end of this episode, I did want to play two songs. One of them came from a listener who had suggested a song for an episode, either focusing on steps two or three. And I came close to playing this song on a previous episode with my friend Tim. And it is the song My Sweet Lord from George Harrison. I put this in one of my playlists, my hallelujah playlists. So one of the things I really love about this is it has a Christian element as well as a Hindu element. So not just coming from one specific religion. And I really enjoy hearing the spiritual messages from a diversity of sources. So here is George Harrison with My Sweet Lord. hearing this when I was a kid and just love, love this song. So the other song that I wanted to play comes from my favorite band, Heilung. They just recently played at Red Rocks in Colorado this week, as well as some East Coast dates, and I was really, really hoping to go see them. I had the chance to get tickets for the Red Rocks show, but logistically I couldn't make the travel arrangements work. So initially, I thought I would be having a lot of FOMO, fear of missing out on this, but my Facebook feed has just been flooded with pictures and videos of the ritual of fans meeting each other, sharing gifts with each other, and it has been just so heartwarming to see that. One of the songs that they performed, and I got to see them perform this back in 2022, is the song Svanrand, and I've been wanting to play this for a while. It's one of their shorter pieces, but oh my god, it is so amazing. It's basically a list of the names of the Valkyries, and the Valkyries in Norse mythology were a host of female figures who decided who would die in battle. The song's title comes from a combination of two Valkyrie names, Pardon my pronunciation, but yeah, those are Svanvit and Randgrithir. So Svan Rand. So with the recording of this for the studio version, along with some of their other songs, they basically take out any pauses for breath. And so it's a recitation that just keeps looping around and around and around. I believe on the recording it is just uh, Maria Franz doing the female vocals and... Kai doing the male vocals. And when they perform this live, they have four women singing and two taking alternate parts so that the recitation can continue. And what's really cool about it is there is a third vocal line that comes in. And so I will be playing three parts of the song where it's just Maria's line at first, then Kai's line added, and then Uh, more female vocals over that. 
And so here is Heilung Svanrand. <laughs> So like I had mentioned when they perform this live, they have four vocalists doing the female vocals. And in the beginning, two vocalists are singing one part while the other two are resting and the other two will kick in. So it, so it just goes around in a seamless loop. For the ending part, it is so cool to see them do this where two vocalists will sing the fast part and then take the slow part while the other two pick up the fast part. And so they start alternating the fast and slow. So you have two vocal lines going around at once. And it sounds like one group should be singing the slow part and one group should be singing the fast part. But it's really the two groups switching back and forth. So that way they can have a little bit more breath control. <laughs> absolutely fascinating and in the performance they have choreography that goes along with this too so it's incredibly beautiful the more i listen to it i can just get into this trance by uh listening to this list of names of valkyries really really awesome so before closing out this episode i did want to mention that i'm still in the process of recovering so there may be another gap in the release schedule depending on how i'm feeling but just know that I do have more episodes planned. And so with that, I'm going to close out this episode. I did receive a few emails and a few YouTube comments, but being that it's taken me three weeks to get this episode finished, I'm going to save those for another episode. And if you did wish to provide feedback for the podcast, you can always email us at feedback at sexaddictsrecoverypod.com. Or if you had any questions about the podcast, want to be a guest on the podcast, you can email me directly at jason at sexaddictsrecoverypod.com. And I thank you so much for tuning in this week. And as always, keep coming back. The views and opinions contained in the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the Bay Area Intergroup or the ISO of SAA. 